I almost started to say this week's episode of Faded Mates is brought to you by, and then I realized we're recording. No, we're, not we're not there we're yet. We're not there yet. Faded Mates Live just happened. <gasps> it did. It's very exciting. That recording will come out in May, everyone. So, yes. Uh, get ready. <laughs> Um, we are like at the point where we're like really like kind of like really fine tuning things. And it was funny because so son, he and I were in like having breakfast this morning before we got pedicures and the Dua Lipa song came on from the Barbie soundtrack. And yeah. she, and we both started like, and she was like, you need to play this at Fade and Mates Live. So I was like, you're right. Because there'll be like music playing while, mm-hmm. you know, we're waiting to get started. And I texted Sarah <laughs> and Eric and your response was. Eric just died a little. <laughs> or something Not really because funny. he doesn't like the Dua Lipa song, but because, well, you are talking to somebody who literally my CD book, listen, everybody, I know that just aged me, but my CD book growing up was like all soundtracks because it was like, it was just the bangers from the movies I liked. Yeah. So Do anyway. Do you remember the brilliance of the like John Hughes soundtracks? Uh, yes. Although you are older than me and that is how we know. Because yeah, that's true. While I do un- I do know many of those songs, they are not DNA coded. The Pretty in Pink soundtrack is was like my life, everyone. My life. I had it on cassette. There you go. <laughs> sure. Um, I did have I had a very I was very lucky in that I had a junker of a car when I was in high school, like a true junker, like you could see the floor through the passenger seat. This is the ground through the passenger seat floor, which, you know, whatever. Um, And it had a tape deck, a tape deck in it. Nice. Yeah. Sure. And I actually almost died uh, on a back road in New York, in, uh, on a back road in Rhode Island, because I kept all my tapes in a shoebox on the floor of the passenger side of the car um, probably covering up the hole <laughs> through which you could see the ground, like the Flintstones. Um, and I was listening to Blues Traveler on tape and like tearing down a back road. This is why parents should not let their children drive. And I was like, mm, I'm not vibing with this. I'm going to change the tape. And I leaned over to get the box. No, Sarah. Came back up and I was driving directly toward a mailbox. Sure. Which I hit a like, not like a blue mailbox, like a, just like a person's mailbox. Yeah, yeah. Which I smashed into and barely avoided flying off a cliff into a quarry. Well, it was definitely I could have died. I would say my most dramatic. So I grew up in a place that was flat. So all of my. There were there were probably yes. quarries, though. I mean, very flat, very flat. <laughs> Ohio, northern they Ohio. Didn't, they don't mine in Ohio. <laughs> no, they okay. plant corn. And what I did was we I like lived in one town, but went to a Catholic high school in the next town. And so we we drove And like, you know, you were kind of following kids who were also driving to school and I was behind this kid. And I like I think about this now and I'm like, how am I alive? How are teenagers giving the keys to cars? It's really amazing. And it was like so there was like a corner coming up where it was like a really sharp corner kind of back. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know that angle, like a, a smaller angle. And I yeah, call something I can't remember what an acute acute or right yeah, anyway like I switch back turn. instead I drove through the cornfield to like cut off the corner and like bounce off into the road on in purpose front of this, yeah in front of the guy ahead of me to like beat him to be You're a jerk. basically racing on the way to school yeah this is like Footloose like you were in the plot of Footloose yes exactly <laughs> and I just all I really remember is like it just doing it like having no thought just being stupid being looking really behind dumb. me in the rearview mirror and seeing this kid's like mouth hanging open like what the fuck did this dumb bitch just do yeah, well you took out like an acre of corn but you sure. did win and that's what's i did important. win and that's what's important scorpio <laughs> season for me <laughs> all the time all right so anyway. no and that poor farmer was like what the fuck these and he knew it he was like these fucking sure kids, these fucking kids a thousand percent and now you are a middle school teacher and you're getting your penance every day. 
every day, everyone, <laughs> not every day. Although it is spring break, so not today. Um, welcome everyone to Faded Mates. We don't always talk about bad driving. Uh, I'm Sarah McLean. I read romance novels and I write them. And I'm Jennifer Prokop, a romance reader and editor and reckless driver. I met a person the other day. I had a Zoom with somebody um, and I got on and I was, you know, looking like this. And she said, I'm a Faded Mace listener and this is amazing. And I was like, I'm Sarah McLean. I read romance novels and I write them. And she was like, yes. <laughs> oh, my God. Amazing. So the hi, bus. Morgan. <laughs> I love it. Okay, so this week, everybody, we are talking about like a real, like we're, I don't know, we're talking about Beauty and the Beast romance. It's like a classic for a reason and everyone loves it. We're really like, I feel like we're really doing the job here on these interstitials recently. Himbos, Great Happily Ever Afters, Beauty and the Beast. What else should we be doing, you guys? What are the like big ones that yeah, we want right. to do? I mean, and we have like a great list and, but like sometimes it's fun to just do these ones that are really like, oh, like primordial to the romance genre even, right? Like Beauty and the Beast is man. Ooh. Did you love fairy tales? Did you love fairy tales when you were a kid, Sarah? I loved this fairy tale. Okay. Um, no, I didn't love, here's the thing. Beauty and the Beast is one of the first fairy tales I think I, I interacted with where like the heroine wasn't asleep or like in a coma or <laughs> like doing yeah. chores the whole time. And was it the Disney version for you? Yeah. I mean, I knew the, I knew the story. I must, I think I had, when I was a kid, I had a book of fairy tales that had all of the kind of like they were not the disney versions they were like the you know grit it wasn't grims it was like but it was like the 70s 80s yeah it had like, like fairy gold tales, yeah. foil on the cover you know i know the exact one i have it's still in my classroom oh yeah and it says to jenny from mago who is our babysitter and it says the year i turned five adorable and so here's yeah, the cute. thing six maybe kids today <laughs> don't have like i bought my daughter when she was like five or six a fairy tale book that mm -hmm. is similar the kind of compendium of it has them all um and she i don't think ever cracked it like i think because there were so many other books and it's yes. not like it's not like picture books didn't exist I, we're not that old but you know it's a really different it's different like for i feel like for us like getting an anthology <laughs> Felt like deal. you were getting 10 books in one. So Beauty and the Beast, though, I feel like it's a real cornerstone text for readers, largely because of uh, the Disney version. Sure, but when I was making that this list library <laughs> of all of these books that I wanted to talk about, a lot of them predate, like, historical romance has predated the Disney version of Beauty and the Beast. Sure. Beauty what year story. was what year was the Disney Beauty and the Beast? To I'm going to look it up, but it was definitely in the. I want to say it was like 1993. Wouldn't that be a shocker? I was going to say like early 90s, right? 1991, which makes sense that Lord of Scoundrels came out fairly quickly after. We we know from our conversation with Loretta Chase that she loves movies and like she rewrote Mr. Impossible. She wrote Mr. Impossible as in dialogue with the Mummy. Lord of Scoundrels is a flat out Beauty and the Beast tale. We're not going to talk about Lord of Scoundrels except to say we love it and go listen to the deep dive. Um, but Beauty and the Beast is a classic for a reason, right? Sure. Right. I mean, it's well, and like you said, I I think we all I also liked it. You everyone's heard me say Rumble Stiltskin was my real favorite. Me too. But I I liked like right, like she was she was not a passive bystander, right? And I also think that there was a lot of like, like he was the one who was cursed and cursed for being an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> right. This a flower will save you. Turn away from toxic <laughs> masculinity. Could we make it any plainer? Um, but also like, listen, in 1991, that movie came out. It was absolutely, I mean, it, it rewrote my, like genetic code, oh yeah for sure because between like Belle going through that town being considered weird because she always had a no her nose in a book and right. then like 
being swept up into this fantasy like castle where everybody's nice to you. And also he has a library that ends all libraries like the dream. Oh, yeah, completely. Amazing. And there are so many. I feel like this is also uh, there's so if you like Google Beauty and the Beast romance retellings or whatever, it's like, you know, a scroll will unroll in front of you. Um, And I think the thing I do think that there are. I think a lot of the books that are on those lists, because I did sort of like peek at those lists yes. after I made my, I like, first of all, I did, this was not a difficult episode for me to prepare for in any way. No. I literally sat down, opened my notebook and wrote 12 books, one after another, after another, after yeah. another. Yeah. And then I was like, oh, let me go see like what I've forgotten. And there were some books that are on these lists that I, where I was, so for example, Judith Ivory's Beast is yeah. on a bunch of these lists, but Fun fact, everyone, Judith Ivory's Beast is not a Beauty and the Beast retelling. Mm. There is nothing about Beauty and the Beast in that book. It is a retelling of Cupid and Psyche. And it is oh, interesting. fucking all right. great. And you should all go read it. But don't believe it. Well, sometimes people make gross assumptions based on titles. I mean, he literally is, he sneaks, they're on a ship and he sneaks into her cabin to make, to like, make her fall in love with him in the dark every night. Like, it's flat out Cuban and Psyche. Anyway. I have I have a feeling you have quite a few historicals. I only have one historical. So I think we I should have start many, many. So why don't we start with historicals? Like you just go and I'll just like jump in with my one. I mean I know there are lots of them, but I figured you would handle that. <laughs> there are some that I think are classics, like in historical when we talk about historicals that are Beauty and the Beast retellings, I think um so obviously Lord of Scoundrels, setting that one aside, because that's the obvious one that everybody thinks of. Um, I'm going to start with, okay, I'm going to start with Eloise James. This one's like low hanging fruit, right? Like it feels sure. like if you talk to anybody who's a romance reader, who's a historical romance reader and say, name a Beauty and the Beast retelling, this is going to be one of them. Um, when Beauty Tamed the Beast is this, is part of Eloisa's uh, fairy tale series. She wrote Oh, I don't know. Um, five books, maybe, that were each a retelling of one of the kind of classic uh, fairy tales. So, you know, there's um, including like the Ugly Duckling and it's it, it's a cute series. It's a it's a very sweet series. So but when Beauty Tame the Beast is very cool because it is simultaneously a retelling of Beauty and the Beast and an homage to the television show House. So fun. Um, House, if you were ever a House uh, watcher, you know that House, the television show is actually, House is based on, uh, he's he's a um, Sherlock Holmes character. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's, you know, the, the concept in is he's this like kind of like renegade doctor who can diagnose anything that other doctors can't diagnose. So like, you know, you think you have lupus. It's never lupus. That's like a running joke in the in the show. But, you know, you think you have, you know, whatever it's they test you for everything. It's none of those things. But you have all these weird, a weird combination of symptoms. He looks at them all and then boom, you have Right. You know, whatever the thing is. Anyway, um, so I think Eloisa was watching. The story goes that Eloisa was watching a lot of House and uh, she got really into this character. And then she went down the research rabbit hole and found a real life uh, Georgian era doctor who like was this kind of doc, like physician where he was sort of gruff and had a terrible bedside manner, but could basically was sort of known to be saved, you know, saved everywhere um, or could save anyone. Um, and so she rewrote this idea with Piers, the Earl of Marchand, who is a, you know, incredibly skilled physician, like knows a lot about the human body and can diagnose basically anything and cure it. Um, but who has, um, you know, I think one of the things that you can sort of love or not love about this shot, this particular retelling, th- this like vibe, Beauty and the Beast, is often the hero is scarred or harmed in some way, has kind of war wound, like has a war wound, has something that he feels he has to hide from the world, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, essentially, this is 
deeply grumpy sunshine, this book. He's like a, a hermit <laughs> in a castle, wherever he is. <laughs> and um, she is his like, she is this like stunningly beautiful, bright, sunshiny heroine who is betrothed to him for reasons. Yeah. Um, and then uh, she heads out there sort of basically feeling like, I can make anybody fall in love with me. I've never had a problem doing that. Like I'm, I'm the sunshiniest, most perfect heroine ever. She's a classic <laughs> Eloisa James heroine. Um, and she gets there and he's a grump and miserable. And she has to like basically pull the thorn from his paw. Jen. Nice. It also has what I believe, and I probably talked about this on the Grovel episode, but it has what I believe is like, literally the greatest moment of a hero having to just like prostate him no that's not right having to <laughs> prostrate himself <laughs> amazing like to a heroine and it is terrific so that's uh elvis james's when beauty tamed the beast perfect okay well let me do my one uh historical which is where dreams begin by lisa Claypis and this is a book, um, I've, I don't know if you've ever had this experience of reading a book and then being like, oh, this is Beauty and the Beast, right? <laughs> Which yep. I is, it, right? So this is not a book that I read because it was Beauty and the Beast. It was a book I read because I recognized it as Beauty and the Beast, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so what happened is, um, what happens in this book is Zachary Bronson is our hero. And he is like, he's kind of a, a proto Reese Winterborn. Aren't they you know, all? He's lowbrow. <laughs> Aren't they all? He's lowbrow. He's rich. But, you know, everyone thinks he's just, you know, they make fun of him because he doesn't have an, an aristocratic background or whatever. And so... He and he's a former boxer turned businessman. So you will like that. Um, and so basically he is looking for someone. I think if I'm remembering correctly, he has like a sister or something. And he's like, look, I'm rich. I'm going to put her out on the marriage mart. But she's going to need to like learn the way. And so he hires Holly Taylor, who is a young widow who has a, a small daughter named uh, Rose and um, basically, you know, he's like, well, you have to live here because, you know, you because you do. I'm the beast. You have to live here. I don't know. Romance reasons. And the th the here's the part that it's funny because I went back to see if my memory was correct. Because sometimes you're like, I remember this, but is it true? Mm -hmm. um, the part that made me like kind of key into the fact that it was a Beauty and the Beast retelling is the description of his home. And it's got that like Derek Craven esque thing, right? Where it's just like, you know, um, like it's just this like wedding cake of a house is essentially the way it's it's described. But in particular, I remembered that she comes in to this hallway, and it is it has like blue silk, not wallpaper, whatever blue silk walls with like butterflies. Like on it. And I just was like, oh, it's Beauty and the Beast. I don't even know like yeah, why yeah, I knew, yeah. right? I just kind of like picture in my brain like the beast holding that like all those butterflies flying or whatever. Um, and so what happens between them is that he ends up just, of course, falling madly in love with her. And it's like all yearning and angst as it is. And, you know, so anyway, it's it's terrific. Um, this one was published in 2000. So it's kind of... And it's, I think, a one-off. Like, I don't think this is part of a series. It's just like a, a literal standalone Beauty and the Beast retelling from Lisa, and it's great. This week's episode of Faded Mates is brought to you by Megan Quinn, author of Bridesmaid for Hire. Okay, so our heroine Maggie is ready for a vacation. She has worked for basically years straight and not had a break because she's... Uh, event planner and a uh, wedding planner. And I mean, weekends are packed and so is all the other time. So she's got a plan. She has bought a ticket. She's going to Bora Bora, which sounds lovely. I also would like to go there. 
And uh, when she gets there, here's the problem. At the resort where she is, is a, the wedding of the century is being planned um, and it's taking place. And even worse, one of the groomsmen at this wedding, Brody McFadden, happens to be her brother's best friend and her sworn enemy because they had a kind of makeout session that didn't end so great at her brother's wedding. Listen. So Maggie has sworn to stay away from him, but she gets this opportunity to maybe be able to be the event planner for the wedding of the century because of romance reasons, except in order to get it, she has to pretend to be Brody's girlfriend and a bridesmaid in the wedding. So (laughs) shenanigans are the Megan Quinn promise in this book. And uh, I think that if that you are into fake boyfriends, enemies to lovers, destination weddings, trapped on a Bora Bora island, making out with Brody's. Yeah, you can pre-order Bridesmaids for Hire right now, or it will be available with your monthly subscription to Kindle Unlimited. Um, thank you, as always, to Megan Quinn for sponsoring this week's episode. And if your podcast app supports it, you can click on the chapter title right now to be taken to pre-order the book, which is out April 2nd. So I think we should talk about this whole, like, scar thing. Because, as you know, I love a scar. Um, Which is probably why I love these books, right? Because often in historicals, there is literal, you know, there the beastliness is a literal mark. Um, and... Obviously, like, this is not, there's something kind of vaguely problematic, or maybe not vaguely, there's something kind of problematic, right, about this, this sort of conceptually in terms of, you know, the, the scar high, forcing a character to hide away, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think there's something very, um, I think what's really powerful about that is like the, Obviously, within the context, it doesn't it doesn't take much work to see this, but like within the context of this particular trope in books that are historical, especially, we are looking at like the mark of patriarchy, right? Yes. Like right. and the way that in in a lot of these cases, like war, we've talked we've talked before on the podcast about how like war is patriarchy kind of like distilled. <laughs> Or supercharged or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And so, like, the in many cases, like, coming coming home from war, having been through something, um, you know, then makes a hero a recluse. And there is only one way to win him and that – or to, to – I don't know if I would use the word win. Like, there's only one way to really, like, woo him and to – to have him like find love and that is to go and like sit inside the kennel with the animal right until he is willing to offer himself like and his like crack open his frozen heart Mm. it's so good it's so good yeah so um there are two people who i think are in historicals where like this is their whole kink like, I actually don't think either of them have ever, well, all right. I think one of them basically has only ever written Beauty and the Beast, like, yeah. in different oh, ways. I love that. And, like, it, it talk about a core story. And that I'll start there. And that is Elizabeth Hoyt. Yes, I would agree with that. And sometimes the Beast is more beastly than others, right? Yeah. Oh, for Especially sure. Especially if we're and talking like, Maiden Lane, yeah. It's not always, like... Beauty and the Beast, but it is kind of always Beauty and the Beast. And so there is a real sense with her that like the heroines are goodness and light and the heroes are darkness and trauma, right? Like, and in order for love to happen, it's like almost morality chain in some, it's definitely like scarred hero in a castle in some. Yes. And it's, but it's always like he's been brutalized by life. Yes. Yeah. And she often has not been like, she is often in like the most classic of ways, 
thrown to the wolves. Yes. Agree. Um, and listen, do I love it? I do. <laughs> I do. Yeah, me too. Yeah. So uh, if you have never read Elizabeth Hoyt, you are in for a treat. There is, I mean, it is just like book after book after book of them just, first of all, when I first stumbled upon Elizabeth Hoyt and I stumbled upon her debut, I think when she wrote her debut, The Raven Prince, we've talked about oh, it on the podcast mm-hmm. before. It is also a Beauty and the Beast retelling. Um, but the, uh, like, these books were sexier than any historicals, any really romances I had ever read. Like, so if you're looking for a, a historical that really is sexy, she's a good choice. Um And I love that first series, but the second series, which is The Legend of the Four Soldiers, is, I mean, this is all about war as well. Um, It's about soldiers returning from war um, and about how they come to, you know, be able to live having seen and done and experienced what they have, right? Uh, The third book in that series is To Beguile a Beast. It's the blue one. Everyone. Okay. Um, <laughs> I love and it. Alistair is a full on recluse. Um, he lives in a castle and he absolutely, he does not, he is not seen. He does not come out. He is like fully Beauty and the Beast coded. Um, and she arrives, the heroine Helen arrives um, to his Scottish castle because uh, somebody has hired, has put a, a job opening in the paper or whatever for a housekeeper. And she is on the run from her own sort of demons. And she gets to this house and he's like, get the hell out. And she's like, no, I need this. Like, I need this job. I need to hide. She also needs to hide. So she goes to this house. Oh, I love that. And they oh. are like, at, they are like just circling each other, like, like rabid animals like it's so intense um elizabeth writes these books that feel like every emotion is just dialed up to a million and it's great i have never had a bad time with an elizabeth white book let me put it that way no and it's funny because you don't it you used to hear about her all the time and now she hasn't written in in a few years um but like listen if you're new here Right. Elizabeth is a really solid place to go. And she's you've got like 25 books to choose from. Who else do you think has like a Beauty and the Beast? Oh, are we still? It's, it's going to be all me right now. Um, I, don't know, I think it makes it easier to just kind of like make sense out of it. Yeah. That um, too. Okay. The other person I have to name check here is Mary Balog. Um, who now listen, these books are less kind of adventure fantasy historicals and much more like quiet e- emotional turmoil romances mm-hmm. like these yes. books are you know emotional really turmoil. steeped the in the it. history of of the of the Napoleonic Wars these heroes have come back traumatized by war in many cases they have PTSD in many cases they have some kind of wound or like long lasting injury from war um the one that i think about kind of on the regular is lord caru's bride um and he has so lord caru has come back this this is like an ancient one this is like yeah. a real real deep <laughs> cut like I love it. Came, like was a signet regency. Oh yeah, that is a deep cut. Yeah. It's on my it's on my shelf and I like uh, every once in a while I pick it up and I just like read through the end. So this is the main character is um Samantha and she is so it's like almost Austinian the way that it's set the setup so she's like taking a walk. <laughs> and <laughs> She meets um, this man who is on, like, she's, like, wandered onto the property of the Marquess of Caru, and she meets him, and he's, like, friendly, but, like, she thinks that he's just, like, a gardener. Yeah. And so, like, she comes back again and again, and they, like, have this friendship, but, like, she's, you know a woman of means and a titled lady and she like has done this um and and so they have that they fall in love in the kind of small 
the small space of this cast of this, you know, estate where he is basically in hiding. And um, then she ends up in London for a season and this and he and like there's another person there's an, like an old lover is back in town um and she you know is searching for somebody to like kind of save her and out of the blue comes this uh comes lord caro who has come down from his castle to prove that he is worthy of her oh. it's really lovely it's a quiet one i mean it's almost friends to lovers in in a sense, but there is a real like sacrificing his e- the the like bruised ego that has kept him away from society for her that is like really the giveaway. Like that's really the the business in at the end of these books. Listen, Mary Bellog writes Beauty a beautiful and Beast, the romance. Lot. Oh, and she's such a beautiful writer. Yes. Right? Yes. Yes. Um, And then I want to talk about, since we're still on it, um, I want to talk about Amelie Howard's The Beast of Bezek, which is probably, (laughs) uh, listen, this is probably the closest thing. If you really just want the Disney movie, but make it historical, like make it, uh, this is the book for you. He is, he literally like breaks plates and like, prowls around <laughs> yells at servants and um the and so nathaniel is his name uh and so but he has been betrothed the, the twist here is he's been betrothed to like some little wisp of a thing and when it gets when the whisper comes down to that woman to the like the woman who he's betrothed to his older sister astrid astrid like ba- basically katniss everdeen's this man and is like uh i volunteer as tribute um and she goes to him and she's basically like you should marry me instead and he's mm-hmm. like why and she's <laughs> like because I don't know, because I'm hot. Like, she basically is like, well, maybe we should just, like, let's just make out. And then, (laughs) like, she sort of makes, like, very bad decisions, poor Astrid, but then, like, ends up in this, like, married to a beast living in his castle, having to, like, control him. It's great. It's a real Mm. fun book that you will all really enjoy. It's the, it's one of the better, one of the best, I think modern historical takes on on beauty and the beast got it um what else do i got i have talked about this a million times so i'm not going to rehash it but brearly which is a a male male world war ii retelling um that's by aster glenn gray um the this is imagine if bell's father like wandered onto the grounds of the beast's castle picked a rose for his daughter and then immediately was face down uh with a dragon like the beast in this case is a dragon and uh that and then they like fall in love bell's dad and the beast fall in love i love it i mean i I can't complain no not at all all right so those are historicals so i think we should move to like kind of paranormal paranormal romanticy as the kids say Mm -hmm. um well your favorite iad my favorite IAD is Demon from the Dark is, um, and your favorite, you could argue like Wicked Abyss. Wicked yeah. Wicked Abyss is great. <laughs> right. So I do think like paranormal, of course, which is just what we used to call it back in the old day, romanticy, I guess. Um, all, I mean, it lends itself, of course, so well to this trope, right? So I was going to start by talking really quick about um, Demon from the Dark, which is Malcolm is a literal demon living alone for the most part on a planet where because of his, like, he just avoids everyone. He just, like, stays in his own realm. And Karu is a witch who is essentially, um, this is in the Torture Island run of the series, gets sent there and um 
she is supposed to essentially like bring him back, right? Like the bad guys running Torture Island want need Malcolm for some reason. And he is just basically like, <laughs> I don't know, this woman fell into my lap and probably I should eat her out. That's my first line of attack. I don't know what to do. I'll just, <laughs> yeah. I'll just, have, I'll just, I'll just eat. <laughs> and really, there's no going down from there. I think one of the reasons I really, I really loved this book is that he like it starts off with like her going to like essentially like the beast castle right this cave or whatever yeah. and he's like hoarding water and and then they get sent to it flips right and they get sent to torture island which she is like get me out of here and he's like no this world is amazing water is falling from the sky right like and there's um and i am i'm sort of fascinated by i think like what i think is the brilliance of that book is sort of taking them out of the beast castle and putting them somewhere he thinks is awesome and she thinks is terrible. Mm -hmm. Right. And then having her like kind of have to try and convince him like there's better places even than this. Um, so yeah, that's definitely one of my favorite. Um, do you want to talk about Wicked Abyss or no? Well, you just mentioned it. I mean, Wicked Abyss, he's basically the devil. He's the yeah. king of hell. Um, and she's like a perfect fairy like right. she's she's beautiful and perfect in all ways and um now the twist on that is that he steals her to right. hell uh because they have you know because of romance reasons they have been chasing each other for millennia right um and she doesn't remember but he like they have been fate mates for millennia yeah. And um, they and so she he steals her basically to her cast to his castle, um, which is the realm of all hells. And yeah. then they dance around each other. There is also he basically at one point is like, I don't know what to do. Let's just eat her out. Yeah. Terrific. Sure. <laughs> the best plan. No notes. And then. <laughs> um, but what ends up happening with that, that I mean, this has like a great moment. There are lots of there are lots of I feel like Cressley really like I mean, this. It's one of the later books in IED, but you could read it. You you don't have to have read the whole series. You can really start there. Um, but what's really remarkable about this is like Cressley really is like cooking with so much gas by the time she gets to this book that like she takes she's just taking every single risk. There's such fearlessness in it. And there are a lot of things that happen like in the end of that book that just feel powerful, like the heroine right. just getting so much power over yes. and over and over again. And yeah. ultimately, like, the hero having to choose to live in the world, like Lord Caro's bride, right? Like, there comes a point in all of these books where at the end, like, if you are writing a Beauty and the Beast retelling, yes, at the end, he has to choose the world. Yes. Yeah. Because... That's the growth, right? Like right. he has, he can no longer, he has to come out of his reclusive space. Right. And choose to live so that he is worthy of her in the world. Right. And like take the risk, right? Which is what love is. Love is a risk for all of us. Um, I think there are few books that do that really as well as Wicked Abyss. Yeah. Well, and I think back to demon from the dark for a minute Karu has a like a younger cousin or niece or something that she's watching a little baby witch and malcolm is like i know the job right now and it is to protect the two of you and Karu's like no not here and he's like yes here right and so like going into the world it gets complicated by the fact that Everything Caro is telling him is essentially like really against what he feels is right when it comes to like having a having a young. Right. Yeah. And so I thought that was really interesting. So, um, well, it's interesting, too. Like, I think Cressley plays with Beauty and the Beast throughout the whole series because and then there's always that sort of underlying. And I'm fascinated by this in general in books. I think this happens a lot in modern retellings of not contemporary, but modern romance retellings of Beauty and the Beast, where the question is like, well, which one is the beast? Mm. Right. Like, who is the mm -hmm. beast in this story? Yeah. Right. And um, 
it's really a compelling, I think Cressley like rides that line really well in a lot of those IAD books. Like the question there can be like, is Caro the beast? Like, and, and that is a fundamental question in the plot of that book. Like yeah, there's a agreed. massive betrayal in that book. And the question is like, has Caro been the beast all along? So yeah, I think it's a great, I think it's a, a great example of it. This week's episode of Faded Mates is sponsored by Hannah Murray, author of Sharing Shame. Listen, you know Hannah Murray, you're going to get all of the good romantic angst and all of the super spice you want. So in this one, we have Veronica, who is all booked to go away for a week to Bermuda with her charming boyfriend. Um, Instead, she finds him charming the neighbor. And so she's pretty mad. She needs someone else to go with her on this double occupancy requirement kind of resort vacation. And so um, what happens is she ends up taking Shane, who's a friend of a friend. And Shane is like too busy to take a vacation. But his boyfriend is like kind of like maybe we need a break. And so he ends up poor guy in a beautiful beachside bungalow with a very beautiful Veronica and only one bed. Shane is grumpy and bearded and Veronica is really ready to jump back into being single by jumping on Shane. But I think the thing is, is like there's all of this complex stuff happening because sure, Shane is bisexual and polyamorous, but like what happens when they get back home? Can this vacation fling turn into a future? This one's perfect for you if you've been looking for a poly romance, if you love an only one bed, if you love it when people make their exes jealous with the sexy times with hot, you know, men (laughs) and others, uh, and if you love a vacation romance, you can get it in print or ebook. And if your podcast app supports it, you can click on the chapter title right now to buy the book. Thanks to Hannah Murray for sponsoring this week's episode. So maybe this is your other one. Is it Lover Awakened? Lover Zadist and Bella? Lover Zadist and Bella, yes. Okay. I mean, that's a classic, right? Yeah. And part of the reason I wanted to bring it up, everybody, is, well, I'll save that. I'll save the why I wanted to bring it up in a minute. But um, Zadist has been a, so he's one of the Black Dagger Brotherhood vampires. And he is, for the first couple of books of the series, just like, This terrifying, even to his brothers, a terrifying mystery. He had essentially been enslaved as a blood slave and sexually assaulted and abused for, you know, millennia or whatever, you know, however that, you know, however long because he's an immortal. And he has a twin brother, Fury, who is like kind of this beautiful, happy, right guy and And so everyone, and I think the brilliance of that is, like, people know what Zadis started out as. Mm. And so his fall from grace, like, the way he was destroyed, is is made plain to them every single day. Mm -hmm. And so he's this, like, terrifying monster, right? And um, Bella is a female vampire, who in the previous book, like, is a neighbor to Mary and brings Mary in. And they have this really, like, raw, like, interaction where, like, he scares the shit out of her, right? And does it on purpose. But yet she is so drawn to him. And he is, of course, like, I'm dirty, bad, wrong because I was abused, right? He's a victim of of, uh, sexual abuse, And so I cannot possibly be good for her because she is pure good, right? Right? And so this story is one that, you know, you're just really like, how's it going to work out? Well, and also like through the first two books, there's this this, like constant sense of like, he's dangerous. Like we, he's a live wire. Like we, we don't know what he might do. Right. And then it's worth reading the first three books of the Black Dagger Brotherhood in order. Like starting and moving forward to this book, because I think the rescue of Bella, so Bella gets like right. in, in the second book, she is abducted by the baddies. Right. Um, right. And she's like, I don't know, is she, ca- I feel like she's kept in a hole. I can't remember, but she's like it's something terrifying. tortured in a yeah, hole. Just, like, listen, right. check all your content. These are, this is all very like, if you have a content warning concerns, you should check them before you go into this. But She's kidnapped. She's being held in a hole and he saves her. 
Yeah. He's the one who rescues her. Yeah. And then she he is the only person she will let near him. Near her, rather. Right. So he has no choice. Now, listen, vampires have to feed. And in the context of this series... It's they sexual. have to feed, it's sexual, and they have to feed from the opposite, well, at least in these books, they have to feed from the opposite sex. Right. That all shifts later in the series. But um, the what's fascinating about this is, like, she won't be near men, so he is her only option. Yeah. And it is such a clever way of pushing it, these two together. This is also... Like, you know how you have scenes that are just like, the, what my, so when a female vampire then goes into essentially a heat cycle, and it's called the kneading because you it's need painful. to fuck, right? You need to, and, and in fact, if you are an unmated woman about to go into the cycle, they will like put you into a, essentially like a medical coma until it's over because you literally, it's so painful, you can't live through it. And the scene where her kneading hits is, I is like the, they hear also because can't yeah, the men like yes, smell it, it and then they go feral. Yeah, it impacts everybody around them. Essentially, it's like like a heat cycle. So when they're all in the kitchen, yes. And then like if you have a mate, even though you're, it's like it's like secondhand smoke. It's only like secondhand pheromones, right? But also so like it's exhausting for the men. Like it's yes. so they're like. They're, I'm gonna These lose guys 100 like pounds seven taking care of this tall. business. <laughs> I mean, it is really for all of like this the seriousness of these books. Like this, this whole it conceit is, is so insane. It's great, but this it is. I I I actually am on record. I don't love Zeta Stimbella. He he's like a little too mean for me, right? But uh, this scene is fucking amazing, and I have read it a million times. Yeah. So here's the reason I brought it up, though, everybody. You have heard me say that she, J.R. Ward, has, like, managed to reboot the series. And I wasn't sure exactly how it's going to happen. But in the last book, which was called Lassiter, she reboots it so that at the end, there is a time jump forward, like, 20 or 30 years. And um, and and it, you're not quite sure what happened. And like some of them are still alive and some of them aren't. And like the Black Dagger Brotherhood is essentially like broken up or whatever. And th there's all these like breadcrumbs about what she's thinking. But the next book, which is coming out, I think soon, this spring maybe, is called The Beloved. And it is Zadist daughter is the heroine. And can you imagine that man with some... Other per no. some vampire sniffing around his vampire daughter, <laughs> and listen, I'm not. I don't. I, I don't love, love that really. Like I'm always like, women are their own. Men do not own them. Fathers, I don't give a no. shit. Like I don't really play that game. But I read. I read this, and I was like, oh, I'm. I'm down for this. I'm. I'm down for what's about to happen. So that is called the beloved, and like I said, it is coming out soon. I don't know the exact date. Sometime this spring, I think. Okay, so, um, oh, uh, I have another one. Okay, that I have talked about before, but stand, but I stand by. Um, Marion Pereira uh, wrote a book called "The Beast Prince" a million years ago, um, and it is really a terrific fantasy. Uh, that it was romanticy before romanticy existed, truly. Um, so. It's the the concept is that there is every every some number there are gods in this world and each they're brother gods essentially and um each one controls some aspect of the world of like nature and um so the idea is that this particular and then each of the gods like lords over some area of what is, I think, Earth like. And so um, this particular god is is the Earth god and he can basically destroy like he can manipulate Earth. He can make stone. He can make landslides. He can make uh uh, like a volcano erupt. Like he can, he sort of can manipulate the planet, the like earthiness of the planet. 
Um, and every generation or so, he must be fed a virgin. <laughs> Right. Sure. I love um, it. In order to keep him happy, because if he is not made happy, he has to um, he he'll like destroy the village, like he'll destroy, you know, the world that he is Lord of. Um, so he's now living in this like kind of rock formation. He's like built himself a Elsa style castle, like up on a hill and he lives up in there and uh, that the heroine of this book, Katsumi, is the captain of the guard of the of the military of this like small outpost like community, and she volunteers to be the Virgin tribute um, to this god this year. Um, and she like trudges up the mountain and like walks into this stone castle, and he's just like laying like a cat, like just sort of. Na fully naked and massive in his human form, um, waiting to be, like, honored. And she thinks she's going to die. But she's going to experience what the French call <laughs> the little death. <laughs> <laughs> she <laughs> there. A deep cut. A deep cut. I'm so a deep romance right cut. It's fine. Um, so, and then of course, it, you discover that, like, in actual fact, he is not, all is not as it seems with this, like, prince god. Um, and he has lost his ability to, like, manipulate the earth. And his brothers, if they find out, are going to fuck him up. <laughs> so amazing. It's really fun. It is actually, um, I don't know. Maybe it's not that fun. It's really fascinating. It is dark and yeah. like serious in a way that, um, you know, can really hit if that's what you're interested in reading. I, I love it. So I will say this. Marion reissued this book was published by Sam Hay in a million trillion years ago and she, um, reissued it. Uh, a year or so back and it is now dedicated to me because I have like basically been talking about the, it went out of print and I've been talking about this book forever uh, and now it's back in print and she said and I don't know her but she said it's because I kept asking for it <laughs> so self-publishing is the gift that keeps on giving sometimes you know because then people just be like yeah I'm putting it up there this week's episode of Faded Mates is brought to you by Toby Carter, author of The Bottom Line. Stella Daniels, our heroine, is very, very loyal to her family. She has put her competitive finance career, which she loved, on ice and passed up a very big promotion to help her elderly grandfather manage his struggling funeral home. Here's the problem. This funeral home is right now in danger of closing. And so Stella's only option is to inject fast cash into this funeral home, which means she can't help the grandpa during the day. She's got to go back to her old finance job and make a bunch of money to help that way. Um, she gets there and she's back on the promotion track, except, uh -oh. except Jen, as always, it's romance offices. There is a very hot, <laughs> very grumpy, very full of himself, a uh, financial guy who's also on the same track to a promotion and they're in competition. Jameson, though, he's there because he's just moved to the States to take care of his mom. Uh, and his father, it happens to own the firm, uh, but they can't let anyone know because Nepo babies are a no-no. Uh, so anyway, Jameson and Stella are at each other's throats. They are, they are fighting for the job. They are sabotaging each other for the job. And both of them have a lot on the line, but also they can't keep their hands off, off each other. Of course not. So this contemporary rivals to lovers romance is for you if you like um brother's ex-girlfriend, complicated family dynamics, and steamy swim lessons. It also is a book that really explores issues around men's mental health. So if you've been looking for that, this would be a great book for you. Um, and if your podcast app supports it, you can look down and click right now to be taken to buy the book. Thank you to Toby Carter for sponsoring this week's episode. Okay. Um, I have 
two more to talk uh, about. Me too. Perfect. Okay. I'm going to talk about Entreat Me by Grace Draven. And Grace Draven is, I don't know if she's still, I, she writes to me like fantasy romance, right? We're not talking romanticy. Like Correct. this is fantasy. And um, she is one of those authors that um, I think people really love because I think she's just very good at the job. And um, in this case, Entreat Me, and I really enjoyed reading this. Like, this is a book I kind of was like, I want to read something new, right? So I was like kind of Googling like, you know, romance, Beauty and the Beast romance. And I was like, okay, this one sounds good. And people really like Grace Draven, so I'm going to try it. And I was not disappointed. And so um, the book is, it starts off with essentially two sisters and their father is um, just like a real wastrel. He has gambled away the family's money or they're not quite sure where the money is going and it takes them a while to figure out and her younger sister uh, the heroine's name is like Lou 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 Louvelin Louvelin I don't it's like a strange spelling everybody sorry yeah. it's probably Welsh it's Welsh Llewellyn mm -hmm. L-O-U-V-A-E-N oh, I don't know see okay I'm just gonna call her Lou Lou's younger Lou is a widow and she moved back home. Her younger sister, though, is Helen, like, kind of renowned for her beauty. Name is Destiny. Name is Destiny. That is not, I don't remember the younger sister's name, but it's something. Anyway, the younger sister is just so beautiful. And the man that her dad owes this money to, essentially, you find out pretty soon, has been like buying up his debt and encouraging him to get in more debt and to encouraging him to make even more risky, um, you know, kind of gambles with his money because what he really wants is the, the younger sister. Now, meanwhile, the younger sister has like a new man. And so Lou's just like, you're not going to get my sister. And he's like, I am going to get your sister because there's no other way out of this. And you have, you know, 10 days or whatever. Next morning, Lou wakes up and her sister has run off with this guy. And the sister um, leaves a note that says, like, I know you're going to be really mad at me, but um, I and she I don't think the sister quite knows what's happening. Like, I think it's like a, a coincidence. She's like, I'm I'm in, I'm going to run off with him. And the the note is enchanted so that Lou can find them because it's enchanted to his home. Now, the thing is that you're like kind of wondering is He's going back, uh, you know, the home he's going back to has appeared in the prologue where a warlord, you know, I was super interested in this, named mm. Ballard. Um, his son has just been born. His uh, his wife is dying and he goes in to see her and it's clear that there's no love lost between them. And she curses him like on her deathbed. And he's kind of like... What's she going to do? Lol. Right. And his man of, you know, his servant is kind of like, I wouldn't really be so cavalier if I were you. And so it's 300 years later and you're like, wait, why does the younger sister's, you know, beau have the same name as the son, the 300 year warlord? Like, what's going on? Well, the curse essentially was the Beauty and the Beast curse. So there is this magic that is seeping into the castle and everyone in there is sort of stuck in time. And the sun can like leave and try and like find cures or whatever. And but he's called back when the the magic is like up, essentially. And so he that's the reason they went back. He felt this pull to like return home. And so Lou comes along and, you know, the son is like, Dad, I just really like this girl. <laughs> and he's kind of like, okay, well, we'll pay off the dead and you can like spend the winter trying to get to know her. But, you know, that sister's probably going to try and talk you out of it. Like there's a, it's so rich, like the whole setup, it's not at all silly. Like it really is like playing into like the beauty and the beast tropes, but like imagining essentially that what we can figure out is like the curse is going to kill Ballard and then move on to the sun. And so finding a way to break this curse is really important to everybody. And like the roses are like poisonous and like climbing up the walls and giving everybody nightmares. And 
Oh, it's great. I really loved reading it. And I was super compelled. Like, you know, when you put a book down and you have to go do something and then all you think about is like getting back to the book and finding out what happens next. Mm -hmm. That's why I felt reading and treat me. It was awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, it's great. It's really good. So um, I also feel like we have to just nod to the Ice Planet Barbarians and all alien romance. Like, I feel like there is definitely human, human heroine, alien hero all has just like a slight vibe of Beauty and the Beast going on. All of it. I agree. So, yeah. Uh, there's that. I do have two contemporaries. I have one. All right. Um, I want to start with, let's talk about Alexa Riley, who we... All right. Never talk about for some reason. A long time ago, Alexa Riley was the Jessicaine of their time. <laughs> um, so I want to talk. Have you read the snow? Have you read Snow and Mistletoe, Jen? I have not. Which is about an audiobook narrator. I have not. I have okay. a favorite Alexa Riley, but that's not it. Uh, I'm. I can guess which one is yours. You perv. Um, you can't so, guess. It's I like can't, such a weird there are one. Twelve million of them. So. Exactly. I'm like, you can't guess. <laughs> You kidding me? I um, can't guess someone's favorite Alexa Riley. Everybody. No, can't impossible. Be, can't be done. There's impossible work. Um, so, okay, but Snow and Mistletoe is really fun. Uh, so the main character, it's a Christmas novella. Her ma- her name is Noelle, obviously. Name of is course Destiny. it is. Um, so she is an audiobook narrator who has been hired by uh, this, like, audiobook producer. I think his name is Alex. And he... Um, spends a lot of time like basically the the moment he hires her he's like obsessed with her voice um alex has been has received has like a terrible injury from a past accident and lives as a recluse in a cabin on a mountain somewhere um so they do all of their work remotely but over the last, like, however long that they've been working together, he has, like, basically become obsessed with her voice. He's obsessed with her. He thinks she's amazing. But he would never, ever dream of telling her because he is not good enough for her, Jen. He just isn't. Of course he isn't. And she, they speak every day on the phone. And she is, like, just crushing on him so hard. Um, luckily, so some very serious audiobook emergencies happen on Christmas Eve. <laughs> of course. <laughs> audiobook emergencies. On romances. Christmas Eve. Listen, romance is on The purest of again. romance reasons. <laughs> uh, there's an audiobook emergency. She has to turn in her final files on Christmas Eve. Like, it's a very serious thing. And then, would you believe, Jen, the power goes out? Oh, what a And shame. so, or the internet goes down. Something happens. And she can't get her files to him digitally. So what is a girl to do but go out in the snow and find her reclusive fox's mountain cabin so she can deliver the files on time and save audiobook emergency and also get eaten out? Obviously. Okay. You said Mountain Cabin. I just want to mention that Kate Canterbury has a book called The Bell and the Beard, which I started but like didn't get far enough to recommend, but I know people really love it, which is he's like an arborist who lives literally in a mountain cabin and the next door, the old lady next door died two years ago. And like, he had to sort of like, no one ever appeared. And, you know, like there was a storm and he had to put up like stuff on the window. Cause like no one was taking care of the cabin. And then he looks out one day and there's a woman with a crowbar breaking into the cabin. And she's like, yeah, it's mine. That was my aunt, whoever. And I was like, oh, this seems like a promising beginning. But that's as far as I got. That's The Bell and the Beard by Kate Canterbury. But the other one I want to talk about was an ad last week, Moonlit Thorns by P. Rain. Nice. Which is a Beauty and the Beast retelling. Annabelle is uh, like uh, just out of college, so pretty young, 22. And her, uh, she's gone home to visit family in like a small town called like magnolia springs or something like that and she has a twin brother named luke in their home and their father has died and their mom is really struggling with depression like can't get out of bed type stuff and she comes home one day from like just like literally being on a run or something and finds like essentially romance law a lien on the front of the house that says you have 10 days to vacate your Mm -hmm. you know ancestral home and she's like what how could this be dad would have never right 
well, dad did, in fact, ever. Um, I apparently had some gambling problems and went to the four billionaire brothers who live next door. One of whom, by the way, this is great. Asher is the hero of this one. And, you know, she goes and talks to Asher and Asher's like, well, fine, but you have to live here. And she like works as a maid for a while and then eventually his assistant and um, all of the things you would expect from Beauty and the Beast telling. But the part I really loved, I is unparalleled, is one of the brothers is Sid. Like they're just like it's Sid and Asher and I can't remember the other two. And at one point he introduces himself to her and his name is Obsidian. I am Obsidian Boss. And I was like, oh, listen, I. I love this fucking genre more than anyone in the I universe except you. Anybody who says that we're not amazing is wrong. Sid. Uh, my name Short is Obsidian. Short for Obsidian. A very common like, baby name. Sure. <laughs> if you are raising billionaire grumpy brothers. I mean, if you're you just... living in a house with your three billionaire brothers, yeah. Sure. So anyway, um, it's great. So Annabelle, of course, is Belle, right? And... One of the things I like that's kind of cute is um, she's allowed to go home every Saturday night. Like, essentially, she lives there, but Saturday night she can go home. But Saturday nights is also the night that, like, something mysterious happens. Yeah, these four and so, have, sure. like, an orgy or whatever happens up in there. So here's what it is. It's really interesting. She notices about Asher, who is not scarred or, you know, beastly at all. He's, of course, de- de- devastatingly handsome. But he has on his hand... Uh, tattoo of a bear so i'll just nice. leave that there i'll just leave that there everybody. Just as like a little morsel dangle a little morsel a little a little tiny morsel so got it those are my beauty and the beast well i think we should talk about one last one i want to talk about jasmine guillory's by the book there which you go is part of the disney new adult line that we've talked about before. Zoraida Cordova wrote Kiss the Girl, which is a retelling, right. a contemporary romance retelling of The Little Mermaid. Mm-hmm. And by the book is Jasmine's take on Beauty and the Beast. Now, the way that these work is they're contemporary. And so they, um, they're, and they are based on the movies themselves, right. not the right. original right. Uh, stuff. So this is like Disney fic, right? Yeah. Exactly. So by the book, Isabel is like in her early 20s and has is working in publishing. Uh, and she is uh, she is desperate to get that promotion, like to like get noticed in a publishing in her publishing house. And um, she uh, overhears her boss talking about this like high profile like recluse of an author who lives in southern california and has just like not delivered they've been like waiting for this Mm -hmm. manuscript forever and they haven't gotten it and she's like i know how i am gonna show initiative and get seen by my boss and everybody else at this publishing house i'm gonna go and like get this guy to write his manuscript (laughs) Good luck to you, Isabel. <laughs> <laughs> um, and she gets there. And essentially, like, what it's really lovely. Like, what ends up happening is she becomes his muse, basically. Like, he he's had writer's block. Like, he's not able to deliver, to write. At, but she is there. And suddenly, like, he's unlocked. His creativity is unlocked. Mm. And they fall in love. Now, listen, these books are no spice. Closed door. Yeah. Um, so, but Jasmine writes a romance beautifully. And, uh, if this is something that you think that you'd be un- interested in, or if you have what I do with these books, I always recommend them to like young people. Like if you're a yeah, young person exactly, you know, right? like, who loves a rom-com or like loves romance, but maybe isn't quite ready for, you know, right. the Alexa Riley of it all. This is maybe <laughs> <laughs> a nice, a sort of slow entry into romance. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. So that I is Jasmine it. Guillory's by the book. Amazing. All right. Well, what a fun trope. If you have an interstitial idea for us or you love a trope and we have not talked about it or haven't talked about it in a while, you can always tell us about it, what you would like to hear us uh, talk about and we will do the job for you maybe. Um, I'm Sarah McLean. I am here with my friend Jen Prokop. We are Faded Mates. You can tell us all about your favorite tropes or your favorite Beauty and the Beast 
Facebooks, at uh, t- on Twitter at Faded Mates or on Instagram at Faded Mates Pod. We're also at Blue Sky and uh, on Threads. And the content in all of these places is different because we're all running different stuff. Um, yeah. So enjoy yourselves, everyone. If you really wish you could have more of us every month, you can join us on Patreon at patreon.com slash Faded Mates. Um, what else? That's it, Sarah. That's Peace what we know. Thanks to everybody who came out on Saturday night for Fate of Maze Live. It was a real blast and we had a great time. All right, everybody. See you next time.